Well, good evening. Welcome to EdChat Interactive, and we're going to be recording this session. So uh, we'd like to thank you all for those of you who are here live and those of you who are, who are watching us uh, as a recording. We hope that you also get a lot out of this, but we'll have you know that you get even more if you can join us live. Uh, tonight, we're having the FETC featured speaker, Sonny Magana, uh, talking to us. And uh, as I mentioned, he's, he's a He's going to be speaking at FETC, and if you register at FETC and use the code EC1129, then uh, you'll get a, I think it's a 10%, might be 15%, but certainly a 10% discount on your registration. Well, okay. welcome to EdChat Interactive. Now, so, so you were in DC today, and you were you were working with some school districts. Um, wh when you, how does that go? What do you what do you do when you work with school districts? Well, you know, uh, professional development is, as, as you said, is really an interactive sport. Learning is an it's a team sport, but it's an interactive sport. So, the way uh, my uh, professional development workshops run is through a progression uh, of uh, foundational learning. Uh, to mm -hmm. get folks to understand the organization of the T3 framework, the research that's behind it, kind of a microcosm. Of what, what we're going to do here is a microcosm of that. Uh, mm -hmm. And then folks really need to think about it, reflect upon it, talk about it, uh, tie that to the past experience, um, make some, generate some claims and some uh, consideration about how they think technology is being used and how it can be used. And then mm -hmm. uh, that sort of um, sets the playing field so that people can think about uh, my T3 framework as a lens through which to view current uses of technology and then move towards not just what works or what works well, but what works best. Mm -hmm. What does the research say works best? And then it's a process of collaboratively uh, planning or implementing in the classroom, deepening the learning, deepening the, the, the understanding of the strategies, and building capacity for evaluating impact. So mm -hmm. fundamentally, it, it's a very interactive process that, that's blended. It's face-to-face, -face, and it's also um, supported with online synchronous and asynchronous opportunities uh, to implement these strategies. And then what, what we're really working on is building a culture of impact evaluation. Mm -hmm. So it's funny. I had a conversation today with somebody who has developed education technology software. Um, and in one sense, I'm glad that you weren't in on the conversation because I think we would have heard you yell um, <laughs> from uh, uh, from Washington all the way to New York. Uh, so the person was saying I developed it's this is a great application. You know, it really teaches kids how to, you know, do science, how to do. Uh, math a lot better and we we put it into the classes and you know the kids didn't use it and I don't understand what's wrong with the kids mm. oh <laughs> it was like oh, yeah. right <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it was like well you know something let's work on this a little bit right <laughs> yeah yeah so uh, as uh, as we're going to be going through today I mean you're going to be you're going to be showing us you know it's not it's not about the technology you know it's uh you know it's about um, it's about the teaching and, use, and using the technology to transform the classes. Yeah. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to pull myself down, okay, okay, and you'll just tell me when to advance the slides, um, like next or, or whatever. And uh, the, you know, it's, at some point I'll probably pop back up because you'll ask, you know, you'll be ready to uh, just have people discuss things. Okay. Here we go. Yeah. That sounds great. Thanks very much, Fritz. and thanks uh, for everyone who's joining us. You know, I'm Sunny Magania, and I'll just tell you briefly about myself. I'm a I'm a teacher. I'm a simple teacher, uh, but I've been really curious about educational technology since 1984. So I've been researching what I consider a wicked problem, which is the, the challenge of modernizing learning systems. So I'm going to share some ideas and thoughts and also evidence base um, that uh, has been 35 years in the making. So this is this is all really new. <clears throat> I, I wrote a book called uh, uh, Disruptive Classroom Technologies. I'm going to be sharing that with you. Um, so if you go to the next slide, by the way, I should say uh, I'm, I'm a futurist. So I'm doing the same thing. I'm imagining the future of education. And um, with 
an eye to a very long-term future. I think we need to take a very long view of what kinds of resources and learning experiences will best benefit learners for the next hundred years. Now, we're not going to be successful at that because we won't know what the next hundred years are going to bring. But the, the research that underpins best practices, teaching and learning is really well established. We just need to modify our thinking about how to use digital tools in order to support uh, modern instruction. Um, I also, I work with uh, Dr. Robert Marzano. He's a, a co-author of mine and a research partner, Marzano Research. And if you want to uh, follow me on Twitter, my Twitter handle is at Sonny Magana, and uh, my website is maganaeducation.com. Uh, so we go to the next slide. And what I wanted to do is introduce this framework. <clears throat> it's the T3 framework for, for innovation. And so let me just tell you a little bit about the framework and its organization, because this is a framework for innovation. It is not a framework for simple technology integration. And I'll explain why that is and what the difference is between the two. So you'll see at first blush, <clears throat> I have higher level domains, T1, T2, and T3. And those are domains that represent a hierarchical uh, scheme of the impact of technologies, not just the value, but the actual impact on student achievement from low to high to very high. And so T1 is translational technologies domain, transformational and transcendent. Within each domain, I have two elements. For translational, the element automation and consumption. For transformational, I have the elements production and contribution. And in the transcendent domain, I introduce the elements inquiry design and social entrepreneurship. So that's just the general organization. This is a hierarchy, but it's also a continuum because it's important to know uh, where the value added uh, elements are in regards to the use of technology. But sometimes we need to go back and forth. We need to start at the um, entry level and go forward. So it is a continuum as well as a hierarchy. And that's the T3 framework. Uh, let's go to the next slide. And um, I want you to think about this. Imagine. Imagine what it would be like to double academic achievement. What would that really look like? What would our classroom spaces look like? And how would we organize our instructional ecosystems when students are learning twice as much as they normally would in the same amount of time? Or conversely, learning the same content twice as fast. So there's two ways you can look at it. Uh, doubling the amount of content that students learn or uh, reducing the amount of time it takes for students to master content. So imagine that for a moment. And as you do, if Mitch could go to the next slide, I have a question for you. We have to start out with this base question. This is the, this is the foundation of it all. What is the purpose of education? So what I'd like you to do is kind of pair up with somebody and just kind of think about this. Think about uh, respond to this question. What do you think is the, is the purpose of education? Why do we meet with education? Uh, with, with, uh, why do we develop education systems and learning organizations? So um, connect with somebody yeah. and uh, have, a, have, a, have a deep chat about the purpose of education. So what I'm going to do, um, uh, Sonny, I'm going to move you down so you could participate in those conversations also. Um, so I'm going to stop your broadcast. And I see a couple of you already doing this, but uh, click on the avatar of another person and uh, let's discuss what's the purpose of education. We'll give you a couple minutes and then uh, we'll, we'll come back up on top. Okay, I'm hoping that you've had some time to talk over this question. Sonny, I'm going to bring you up now also and uh, bring you bring you into another stage next to me. And I'm sorry if I interrupted you, your, your conversation. So, um, you know, there, there must be a lot of different things that pe when people really think about this, they must, there's a lot of different angles because I know they, the most basic one you could come up with is that uh, the purpose of education is to uh, get kids out of the house so the parents can work. 
<laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Kind of like his jails, all the way to, um, you know, the purpose of education is to give everybody a chance to live a great life. Um, so what, is, what are some of the answers that you generally get from people? A, a range, and, and I'd like to invite uh, Paul to come up on, on the stage with us and, and share his, his thoughts. But like you, I, I hear a range of things from preparing uh, kids to enter the workforce. Um, right. In the old days, it used to be preparing kids to uh, uh, be able to work in the fields and work on the farms and when we were an yeah. agrarian-based uh, society. So there are multiple purposes of education, but in the modern context, things have changed. So, Paul, can we bring Paul up? and um, Sure. More? No video, but, um, but I can okay. bring his audio up. Okay. And, Paul, you're on. Lucky enough to talk with Sonny about, you know, what is the purpose of education. Uh, and we talked about future readiness, how it's about, you know, preparing kids for a future that will for their future, a future we don't know about. And, you know, I talked about um, how a lot of what I do is, a, is in the computational thinking area. Um, but for me, it's that's all about the problem solving, the, the thinking that uh, precedes all the coding because that's a skill that every kid's going to need is to be a good problem solver. Um, so yeah, that was uh, talking about the capacity to, to, to get kids to be able to engage with all this kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. the capacity to engage and to think, uh, the, the thinking that underpins the, the, the techniques and the mechanisms of coding is really what comes to the forefront. That's what's really important. Couldn't agree more, couldn't agree more. Um, Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Paul. It was a pleasure, pleasure. Well, let's... Um, uh, I'll bring myself back down and uh, we okay. can move on, I guess. Yeah, great. Well, let's put on uh, the next slide and I'll say I've um, arguably, I think this is a reasonable purpose of education that it's twofold. And Paul nailed one critical element. But I think the purpose of education is indeed twofold, is to ensure that students you know, achieve ample academic proficiency to master current learning, to be masterful at the content of the word they're learning now, and then consolidate that knowledge and the skills, but also the mindset, you know, the head and the heart to successfully master future learning challenges as Paul you know, eloquently described. So it's really twofold, current learning mastery and developing the skills for future learning mastery. And that's what makes teaching so uh, challenging and so so great, frankly, because we are futurists. We don't. Many folks don't often <clears throat> see themselves as futurists, but teachers are futurists. But we have to remember that we mustn't um, put all of our eggs in the future basket. We need to be able to to balance between helping kids master what they're learning right now, the literacies and capacities now, <clears throat> in order to apply that in the future. So let's go to the next slide because now I've got another question for you. Um, are we generally, by and large, using technology to simply digitize what could be considered an industrial model of education? So let me define what I, <clears throat> what I mean by an industrial model of education. I mean, a, 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 an education model where <clears throat> we're preparing students for a rather mechanistic approach to problem solving with uh, memorization um, and surface learning as being a privileged, that we're privileging memorization and surface learning. So are we using technology to simply digitize an industrial model of education? So let's go back to our um, um, uh, small group uh, 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 discussion and uh, uh, let's think about this. And we can even... Well, we yeah, and I'd like to, you know, so this is, um, as I'm looking at the question, it's kind of like yes or no. So you probably are, want people to have a conversation about this, right? Yeah. Not just not just answer the question, but maybe you know think why do they think that way, um, yeah. and what are and what are yeah what's the evidence that we're doing that or that we're not doing that, and where mm -hmm. are we doing yeah. it and where are we not doing it? Okay, so I'll, I'll right. pull you down and let you let you participate in the groups also, mm -hmm. and uh, this time oh let me shrink the slides this time you know the drill, and so we'll give you another chance to uh, to talk with somebody. So uh, hopefully you've had a chance to, uh, to, to have a conversation. And, uh, I, you know, I noticed that what's interesting is that we seem to have a uh, an pretty international audience tonight, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, we have uh, uh, somebody from Australia. We have somebody from Finland. Uh, we have uh, you and me from the United States. Uh, uh, Marsha yeah. from, um, yeah. So that's 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 pretty from Palau. It's pretty remarkable. Yeah, it's remarkable. Yeah. So now so, let's see yeah. if we all agree. <laughs> let's see right, if we have an international right. agreement, and then we should start our own United Nations, our United Education Nation. <laughs> uh, right. uh, that's, uh, I, I agree. <laughs> so let's uh, let's go to the next slide because I I think we are generally. Um, uh, taking a 21st century frosting and putting it on a 20th century cake. What we've been doing is what I call a planar shift, a planar shift. So we're on one plane and we're moving from an industri industrial age education system to a digital age education system. And we're simply digitizing uh, 20th century practices that really focus on um, detail memorization, on um, facts, that can be recalled and retrieved, and that's being tested, and academic vocabulary. But we're using digital tools to, to uh, augment uh, essentially a, a, a surface-based learning model. And that in no small way is um, contributing to the wicked problem of technology and education. What I suggest is we have an axial shift. Now let me explain what I mean by an axial shift. So uh, if you could go to the next slide, Mitch. An axial shift changes the axis upon which we are uh, operating. And instead of um, shifting from industrial to uh, digital age systems, we should be moving away from memorizing old knowledge and instead focus on, focusing on whole child mastery and well-being and whole organizational mastery and well-being. So moving from the x-axis to the y-axis and changing what we do so that we focus on the upper quadrant of this um, image, of this uh, uh, system, uh, and focus on learning for mastery. And that is mastering current learning and being able to um, help students consolidate the requisite knowledge and skills to master future learning. Now, that's a tough one to give up because so many of our educational systems uh, really privilege memorizing old knowledge by the use of examinations, summative scores, standardized uh, examinations that really test knowledge memorization at a very surface level. It privileges surface learning. That is a big shift that I think needs to occur. And this is not an ideological shift. This is not a, a technique shift. This is a shift in consciousness. We need to shift our consciousness away from sim simple memorization of, of facts and focus on the well-being and mastery of children. Because in a, in a digital age, factual knowledge is available at our fingertips, on our phones, on our devices. And I don't think it's sufficient uh, uh, for students to memorize what they don't really need to memorize because they can access that information. Now, to some extent, there may need to be some surface learning, clearly, but it's a, it's often seen as the stopping point. And frankly, it is a starting point. So let's go to the next slide. Um, it's a starting point that I've been really focusing on in my book, Disruptive Classroom Technologies, which we're gonna get into here. Uh, I show how to make this shift in consciousness to whole child mastery and well-being and whole system mastery and well-being. If you go to the next slide, Mitch. So now let me ask you another question. Now this is, this is one where uh, I, I want you to really think about what do you think is the average impact of technology on student achievement? So to give you a framework, think of a scale from one to 10. From one to 10, one being very low, 10 being very high, the highest. On the scale of one to 10, what do you think the average impact of technology is currently on student achievement? And how might you consider that? So pair up and let's see if we can come up with a number. Okay, here's your, here's your chance again. And uh, I'm gonna make it, throw in a wrinkle, uh, pair up, uh, come up with a number and also a justification for that number. And the reasons why, you know, what are the things that we're doing that are, making that that impact and uh, we'll we'll resume in a couple minutes 
Yeah. So, so it's funny is, you know, I look at, um, I, I spend a lot of time in classrooms also and, and watch watching teachers and see how they use technology. And, you know, very often the technology is merely used as a reward mm, or yeah. the technology is used to dress up things that the kids would be doing anyhow. Like you have a, um, a sugar coated, worksheet <laughs> you know they're, they're doing the same things they would be doing on a worksheet but they just happen to be doing them on the computer um right you know rather than something that really leads to a you know a a, a shift in the way kids understand something it's um and it may not even be helping for some for some kids uh is that where is that kind of like where you were going or what did what did yeah, people say absolutely. when you were talking with yeah. them yeah, absolutely. That's a great insight. So, uh, and, and we had a great conversation uh, uh, in our in our little group. So let's go to the next slide, and I'll, I'll share uh, what the actual answer is. What does the research evidence tell us? Because we really should be focusing on the highest quality evidence that exists. And there are levels of research. I mean, there's research and there's research. And so, what I'm going to share with you is the research by John Hattie, <clears throat> and uh, uh, he's uh, from New Zealand, but he's currently. Uh, the director of um, Graduate School of Education at the University of Melbourne in Australia. And John is, is a, a research partner, and he uh, um, is a very kindly uh, peer-reviewed my book. And here's what he said. Uh, let's go to the next slide. He does a kind of analysis called meta-analysis. So he looks at not just one study, not dozens of studies, but tens of thousands of studies. And when you have a very, very large sample size, then you're more likely to get a much more reliable measure on the impact of an influence. So John's uh, seminal book called Visible Learning, it's been referred to as sort of the holy grail of teaching, lists all of the influences that he studied. He studied over 256 influences. And in order to make it easy to understand the impact of those influences, he has developed a scale. So let's go to the next. Hey, by the way, the scale uh, determines effect size. And effect size is a number that's uh, calculated from all that meta-analysis. And it, it, it's a scale. So he gives us this odometer from negative impact. I give you one to 10, but he uses uh, decimal points. So from a negative 0.2, 0 0.2, all the way up to positive 1.2. This is an effect size scale. I want you to pay attention to this um, arrow. This is 0 0.4. 0 0.4 effect size represents the average of all of the influences that he studied. So of the 256 influences that he looked at, the average impact is 0 0.4. And another way of saying that is that 0.4, an effect size of 0.4, represents the average amount of learning, the average quantity of learning that the average student gains in the average year. So 0.4 is the tipping point. It's the average. We want to get to uh, this area in blue, the zone of desired effects. And those are things that work, work well. And once we get to uh, 0.8, that is a doubling of academic achievement. A 0.8 effect size is, is a doubling of achievement. And that's where we want to be really focused on, on not just what works or what works well, but what works best? So now with that in mind, you can go to the next slide. The average impact of technology is 0.34. So John uh, looked at 161 different meta-analyses from over 10,000 studies, and he found that the average effect of technology is 0.34. And here's what's even more alarming. And this was just published <clears throat> uh, last year. Um, he actually uh, published this in my book. And uh, I, I built upon this, and now I'll be publishing it in a research report that'll come out in, in the next few weeks. That effect size hasn't changed in 50 years. In 50 years, the effect of technology has been stuck at 0.34. So now that's that's a head scratcher. <laughs> you know, that's a real that's that's befuddling. How is it that since 1968? to 2018, the average impact of technology has been a three on a scale of 10, 0.34. And you think about the amazing evolution of technologies in the past 50 years, and the and the impact is still so low. It's confounding. So, so if I understand this correctly, then if we, uh, 
if we just added technology to classrooms, mm -hmm. then students effectively would learn less than they do wow. under average circumstances. Because on exactly. average, they learn 0.4. Yeah. So Before. technology is 0.34. Wow. It has a slightly negative effect on average. Now, there's a range. There will always be a range. And there are some uh, 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 effect sizes that are larger, some that are even smaller. But go to the next slide, and that'll see. It'll show you that the average effect size is 0.34, which is indeed l slightly less than average. Now that is alarming. That is quite alarming. Now this is the preponderance of evidence. This isn't just one study or dozens of studies, but over 10,000 studies were analyzed, and that means that technology has not had the effect that we had hoped. Now there's a lot of reasons for this. One of the reasons, as I mentioned, was that we've tended to focus on a planar shift and just use technologies to digitize 20th century teaching and learning strategies. And I think we need to make move to an axial shift. Let's go to the next slide. And I'll show you um, uh, in more detail what I mean by so that. So, I'm, so I'm, I'm, what I'm thinking is, as I'm even looking at that, is that, you know, there's the, the, when a child is using a book, you know, they can go back and forth really easily. They can circle things. They can highlight things. They can write in the margins. If all we did in technology is change that book to a PDF, that's actually degradating the experience of the child. And in, really in essence, most technology that we implement in the classroom probably isn't, isn't that bad, but, but it's, it's, it's similar. It's like not... Um, yeah. I hate the term thinking out of the box, but <laughs> in, in essence, that's what we have to figure out is to think out of the box, yeah. right? Yeah. We're just simply, you know, digitizing uh, the consumption process. And so th I'll talk about that in the T3 framework, because I think you're absolutely right. Uh, just uh, uh, turning a textbook into a website or an interactive website has had a deleterious effect on student achievement, a slightly negative effect. So now this question is sort of a, a, um, uh, 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 a prompt. Does any valid research exist that shows how to reliably improve student achievement with technology? Um, and so, so I'm going to take a guess. I'm going to take a stab. And I'm going to say that there is no research that says that solely technology will dramatically improve student achievement. That's just a guess. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Or do you want, to, do you want people to discuss it? or? Um, I think or I, maybe you no. Know, you threw a really interesting wrinkle on this. Let's let's absolutely discuss it. Does any value exist that shows how how to reliably improve student achievement with technology? And Mitch has uh, kind of uh, peppered us with with a, a, an idea. Is it the technology or is it the pedagogy? So let's let's uh, have a little discussion about that. Um, okay, I, uh, so I'll move share you. So yeah, I'm going to uh, shrink the slides. I'll move you down Great idea. and let you join the discussions. Okay, so okay. You, I, I saw you talking with, with somebody. Um, maybe somebody wants to raise their hand and, and volunteer to come up and share yeah. um, share their thoughts. Or yeah. ah, there's 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 a volunteer. So okay, ah, there's Yussi. So let me let me bring Yussi up. Yussi, welcome welcome from Finland. Thank you. Um, this is an interesting uh, line of discussion, and I'm kind of a thinking. So, lumping everything under technology is kind of a big step, and uh, having you know a normal of it. Uh, to me, it's like saying, do let's think about books. Uh, have books have had uh, uh, impact on learning and. What I think is that then you need to kind of a subcategorize a little more. So you might have a comic books, you might have a, you know Harvard Business Review, you might have a, 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 you know pamphlets of uh, uh, dystopia. So uh, to me, more relevant question is kind of uh, um, what what are smart pedagogical use cases for technology. And how do we pair these two up to achieve maximum impact? So that's what I'd like to bring up to the attention. Wonderful. I, that, 
Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Uh, and I, uh, you, you are absolutely correct. Uh, and I had a nice conversation with Paul as well, uh, that it is not just if technology is used um, or, the, or even the type of technology it's used, but how it's used and to what intent. What is the learning objective that is supported by the technology and who uses the technology? So thank you very much, you see. That's a, that's a rich uh, uh, set of ideas to, uh, for me to um, share the next um, uh, piece of information. So um, if we can go back to, uh, yeah, perfect. So let's, and this is a bit of a setup question because the answer is obviously yes. So here's what we found. The strategies in the T3 framework have an effect size of 1.6. 1.6, and this is compounding evidence, compounding evidence from Hasted Marzano, myself and, and Mark Hasted, uh, myself and, and Robert Marzano, and then I continued this line of inquiry for uh, uh, last, uh, uh, well, we really, we started in 2000, I started in 1984. Um, an effect size of 1.6 is an enormous effect size. It's equivalent to a quadrupling of student achievement. So that's like a child learning four or more year, uh, years worth of content, a single academic year. Uh, really, this is, uh, we, we were kind of so surprised when we did this research. It was quasi-experimental control, and we had a control group and an experimental group. And there was uh, a common thread of the teachers that had that very, very large effect size. And I can explain that um, in, using a metaphor. Now, that is really a remarkable effect size, you know, a quadrupling of a That's a moonshot. That is, that's really, you know, off the scale. And I can summarize all the research. I think if you go to the next slide, Mitch, um, I'll tell you why. Here's, you know, I'm a musician and I, I love playing guitar. Some of you, uh, I know Yusu was here earlier when I was uh, playing a little music in the, in the, uh, uh, before we started. When it comes to modern teaching and learning, high impact pedagogy is the melody. And high impact technology use adds the harmonies. And together you get great music. It's really all about which pedagogies are used and learning strategies are used and how technologies can enhance the impact of those pedagogies and learning strategies. Unfortunately, I think too many folks have been focusing on the technology itself and the technology has become the object. It's become the objective in and of itself. Just using technology uh, it becomes the the goal rather than understanding what high impact pedagogy is and how we can use technologies to support that. But that's a, that's, that's a, a profound idea, I think. Now, there's been, and I don't remember the name of it, you probably do, that there's been these studies that if a child has one teacher versus a child in a class, the child with one teacher is kind of two orders of magnitude or two standard deviations more likely to, to or it will learn two standard deviations more. And so it seems to me that when you, that this is kind of, this is really is the holy grail because when you, when you pull together technology with changing your teaching methodology to produce music rather than just a melody, you really can even overcompensate for that loss that we experienced with putting kids in classes versus having them one-on-one -on -one with the teacher. That's, that's a really good uh, point, is that the order of magnitudes and that we, we are kind of making up for that loss when we have 25 or 30 kids in the classroom. So how do we use technologies in a way to amplify the potential loss by just having a large group of students? And I think mm -hmm. technology can, can be like Archimedes' lever and help us push the entire uh, system, not just a whole classroom and whole job, but the whole organization, the whole learning system forward by four degrees of magnitude, which is remarkable, remarkable. Mm -hmm. So let's go to the next slide and I'll show you, uh, go a little bit um, more into John Hattie's research because John published a paper uh, a couple of years ago on his model of learning. And um, uh, we, I've been interacting with John for some time and what we found is that tremendous similarity between the work that I'm doing, the work that I've done with Marzano and John's uh, work. John suggests that there are three phases of learning. Surface learning, which is where students learn the basic facts, the basic details, that knowledge memorization that I mentioned. All too often that's seen as the ending point, but it's really just the starting point. Once students have uh, acquired 
that surface level information. They have to consolidate it so that it becomes part of their longer term memory. And the only way they can do that is by engaging in deeper learning the deep phase where they start to make connections between that information and prior knowledge, uh, elaborating on that knowledge, um, using that knowledge to uh, generate metaphors like the rock and roll metaphor or uh, analogies or similes, and then providing evidence that supports that deeper learning. Now, that interaction at the deeper learning phase requires a completely different set of strategies than simple memorization. It requires inferencing, talking, vocalization, um, generating testing kind of claims uh, on the fly, and, and using um, a more discursive and experiential approach to deepening that knowledge so that, it, so that students are not just learning basic facts, but are now working at the deep conceptual understanding level. But then at that phase, they're only acquiring the deep knowledge. In order to consolidate that deep knowledge so that it becomes part of their permanent self, they have to actually apply that knowledge and use it in a context that's different than the context in which they learned it. That's called knowledge transfer. When students are engaged in the knowledge transfer phase, then that knowledge becomes not, not an end to itself, but a means to an end, a means to solving some rich in, uh, engaging problem. So those three phases, surface, deep, and knowledge transfer, is where I think we're, uh, we can uh, hone in on the reasons why technology has had such a low level of impact, because we've been focusing on the surface learning far too much, and not enough on the deeper learning, and not nearly enough on knowledge transfer. So in my model, I also have three phases. And so if you go to the next slide, they, they highly correlate. Um, the, by the way, the, the effect size of 1.6 is quite literally off Hattie's scale. And when we use technologies to support surface, deeper, and knowledge transfer, that's when we get such a very large effect size that is, that is um, off the scale. Uh, if we go to the next slide, and that's what the T3 framework is designed to do. So let me have a little discussion about this. Um, uh, I call automation in the translational phase. That's when we use technologies to automate tasks, teaching pedagogical tasks from an analog environment to a digital environment. That's when we're just taking, uh, uh, moving from a pencil and paper and instead um, uh, using digital tools to automate budgeting, testing, um, grading, communication, presenting information. Uh, that's, it adds value in terms of efficiency time saving, and even um, re reduction in errors. But it really has very low impact on student achievement. So instead of using a, a, a worksheet, students use a digital worksheet. It's a very, very popular use of technology. The second element is consumption. And that's where students are consuming knowledge and, and uh, content related information using a digital tool. They're using a, a laptop or a, a mobile phone or a tablet to consume information that was once consumed in a book or a magazine or an encyclopedia. We're, at the translational level, we're just translating from an analog to a digital environment. In the next domain, the transformational domain, that's when the learner is transformed from a passive consumer of content and knowledge information to an active producer of knowledge and, and knowledge representations. And in the first element of my, of my framework, production, that's where students do three things. There are three strategies under production that students produce personal mastery goals that are related to the learning intention of any content area or unit of study. So they create their own mastery goals they monitor and track three things. They use technologies to maintain an understanding of what those mastery goals are, and then track their effort, how much effort they willingly invest, uh, the progress that results from their effort, and how they feel. Their emotional state is an essential component of the whole child development, social and uh, um, emotional uh, capacities of children. When students become better at self-regulating, 
they realize that when they go into that deeper phase, it, it's a struggle. You know, it, it, it takes energy and it takes will. So the surface level can be think, thought of as skill. The deeper learning can be thought of as will because students have to sort of delay their gratification and, and regulate their emotional state, their effort, and, and build compensatory strategies so that they can continue to struggle during that deep learning. Contribution, oh, by the way, in the, the, the final strategy in production is when students produce knowledge representations, stories, elaborations, schema, constructions that represent and, ex and express what they know, which is their declarative knowledge, what they can do, which is their procedural knowledge, and how they think about it, how they've arrived at their declarative and procedural knowledge. So students make their thinking journeys explicit to themselves, to their teachers, and one another. In contribution, students contribute to the teaching of others. And they use digital tools to create tutorials, digital artifacts that are not just assessment items that represent what they can do or how they think and what they know, but these are uh, expressly developed tutorials to teach their peers what they know, even if they have errors, even if they have some omissions that are left out, having a representation and using that digital representation as a prompt for richer classroom discussions makes all the difference in the world. So it's at it's a, these two elements, production and contribution that were studied. And when, when teachers master the, uh, the properties, the, the strategies, of production and contribution, that's when we found an effect size of 1.6, which, which helps kids master current learning. But as we said before, that's only half of the purpose. Half of the purpose of education is to help kids master current learning. The other part of uh, the purpose of education is to help kids master future learning. And that's what the transcendent domain of technology use is all about, to help kids uh, consolidate the requisite skills, knowledge, aptitudes, and thinking capacities to engage in what I call inquiry design. And that's the first element. In an inquiry design, students um, identify, use technologies to identify and investigate a wicked real life problem that matters to them. This is not a problem that's given to them by their teacher. This is something that the kids care about. And they investigate it and, and engage in the thesis process that I've um, uh, uh, modified uh, slightly uh, in order to make it really manageable in the classroom. Uh, and, and it is a, an inquiry-based approach where students choose what problem they want to solve and then go about uh, engaging and developing a problem statement and uh, hypothesizing solutions to that wicked problem that matters to them. Now, that wicked problem could be a community problem, could be a school problem, could be a global problem. It could be a social justice problem. It could be an environmental problem. It could be an economic problem. And we use the uh, uh, sustainable development goals for the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals as a, uh, a guide to provide students with whole domains of wicked problems that matter. But then we go a step further. In the social entrepreneurship element, students use digital tools like uh, coding platforms or app building applications uh, to develop more robust solutions in an iterative fashion, in an ongoing way to develop a more sustainable, robust solution to the wicked problems that matter to them. And that's how kids develop mastery for future learning by engaging in inquiry that is based on their passion and their purpose for making the world a better place. And then helping them develop the tools and the facility with tools to create a more robust app, a platform, a website, a podcast, uh, a story, some way to raise awareness of the problem and also solutions to those problems in an iterative fashion. That's the hallmark of innovation. And it's social entrepreneurship combined with inquiry design, because you have to start with a problem and then develop innovative solutions to those problems. So that's really the, 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 
basis of this uh, uh, framework in the transformational domain, kids can quadruple their academic achievement, but that's not enough. We also have to make sure that they are uh, able to successfully master future problems. So, you know, as I'm looking at these three dots, and you and I were actually talking about this earlier, it isn't like a school can say, or just, you know, uh, all right, so I see, I, I get that. So let me now, um, tomorrow we're starting, we're going to do social entrepreneurship with our students and we're going to get all the way there, right? Mm -hmm. um, it takes time. It takes time. So how, how do, you, do you have to go through step by step? Do you, does it, is it more than a month, more than a year? How long does it, you know, what do you have to do in, in, as a district or as a, or as a teacher if I wanted mm -hmm. to do this in my classroom? Yeah, great question. Um, uh, a, a lot of folks uh, think that they can um, uh, just jump right in and go to social entrepreneurship right away, or they they uh, bypass production and want to go to contribution, and then and they want to do it all very very quickly because we we know you know as teachers we want to do what's best for our students, and so we tend to want to take on too much too quickly and move too fast. What I suggest is that we take a long view and plan for at least three years to get to the transcendent phase on for the whole system. Now, some people might be ready to go a little bit sooner, but it is a sequence. It is a progression. One can't run before one walks, and one can't walk before one crawls. You can't really jumpstart that process. So we really need to take our time and just choose one strategy, one or one element at a time and develop our facility with that in order to build capacity individually and then build collective efficacy. So I suggest at least three years for a whole system to develop their understanding of the framework and then use that as a model, a language for innovation and uh, and then develop their capacities for each element and each strategy in the element in a sequence, but don't try to short circuit the sequence. And it probably helps to do this with other people. Like as Absolutely. an individual teacher doing it, you know, yeah. that's one way of, you know, I guess you could, but you're much more likely to be successful if there was a team of four or five teachers mm -hmm. and they, they mapped it out for their team and they uh, compared notes during the course of this uh, two plus three year journey, yeah. right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and it has to start with uh, a collective. You know, really what this does is um, helps to build collective efficacy. And that's mm -hmm. one of the things that I'm working on with uh, John Hattie at the moment is what is collective efficacy? And that he, he did a meta analysis of collective efficacy. Um, it has an effect size of 1.57, which is very, very wow. close to 1.6, yeah. very, very low effect size. Collective <clears throat> efficacy is a very happy state where everyone in an organization, every teacher, every administrator, every instructional coach, every support person, person in the school believes that what they're doing will improve student achievement. And the first step to building collective efficacy is to have a common language of highly impactful pedagogies, the melody, and high impact technology use, the harmonies, in order to uh, make great music together. The whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And when systems are focused on whole system growth and mastery and whole child growth and mastery, that is a change in consciousness. And that's mm -hmm. what's required to really wow. do this. You know, it, it really is. Well, you know, so, so now, like, I'd like to have an hour conversation on collective eff efficacy also. Yeah, but yeah, uh, yeah. seeing as how we're at uh, 9.05 or 9.06 Eastern time, um, maybe we should move on to the next slide and reserve yeah. this for, you know, people I seeing know you at FETC yeah. or uh, people contacting yeah. you. Yeah, absolutely. So let's go to the next slide. And thank you for that. Uh, so what John uh, wrote a review and he said that, you know, this, this T3 framework really aligns beautifully with visible learning. Uh, and inviting, you know, how we use technology to move beyond just the surface to go to the deeper learning and the knowledge transfer. And I was really, uh, I'm so grateful to Professor Hattie for his his uh, review and uh, very uh, uh, kind uh, comments. And so I'm calling this the T3 challenge. And so I challenge systems I, <laughs> to, I, to 
uh, double academic achievement. Because if these strategies hold true, and so far they have been, so far the preponderance of evidence shows that an effect size of 1.6 leads to a quadrupling of achievement, and, and it's been replicated. Doubling achievement is on the way <laughs> to quadrupling achievement. So that's my challenge. Is and he said it's an exciting, powerful, incredible challenge that that I've offered. So let's go to the next slide and what what I and, and it's um, easier than scaling the Matterhorn, right? It is. It is. <laughs> yeah, which was also a team effort. So for <laughs> those of you that want to learn more about the T three framework, um, uh, this is my my kind of last question is to think about you know. So now what? So you're interested. You 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 may want to learn more about this. You may want to share this with colleagues. Think about uh, the book. Uh, the, uh, Disruptive classroom technologies, and then if you can go to the next slide, uh, in my in my um, uh, website, and follow me on Twitter at Sunny Magana uh, or uh, my website Magana Education, because I am launching this T three challenge globally, and in order to help, I've developed a series of online uh, learning courses where teachers can earn uh, badging, micro credentialing as at each level of the framework and become and get a badge as a T1 innovator, a T2 a transformational innovator, and a T3 transcendent innovator. And what that will do is it'll help teachers in the professional development sequence move from just the surface learning, what the terms mean, the organization of the T3 framework, the, the basic facts, the basic recall, and go into deeper learning learn the, the research, the pedagogy, uh, the strategies that are in that framework, implement them in their classroom, and then be able to evaluate the impact and learn how to calculate an effect size in your classroom so that you can uh, uh, double academic achievement and have the data to, um, to demonstrate that. So uh, that's where you can go. Uh, and if you come to FETC, come and, come and visit me. I'll be at the, uh, uh, in, in during my uh, several sessions at FETC. So uh, I'll, I'll look forward to seeing you there. And that's where you can learn more and, and to go deeper. Well, I'm looking forward to, to seeing you in person at FETC also. Um, yeah. and, 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 uh, and, and discussing it, and actually, if I, if if it's at all possible, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to attend your your at least one of your sessions because they look fascinating. And thank, thank you. you, thank you thank for you. for coming on tonight. Thank you. Thank you. And um, you know, I'll see you in I'll I'll see you in a couple months. Then that sounds great. That sounds great. And okay, to, do you have uh, a final thing that you want to um, leave people with tonight? I do. I think I have one more slide, uh, which is this. Ah, um, okay. I ah. dare you to double academic achievement. I dare you to dare the teachers and the people in your um, uh, learning systems to double academic achievement. And here's the, the hopeful part. If you go to the next slide, this is what it all starts with. It all starts with imagine. Imagine what it would look like if you were to unleash students' latent, limitless learning potential and wield technology tools to have kids express their passion and their purpose, not just for learning, but for applying their learning to improve their world. And I think you can do it. So there, yeah. I think you it's all can do it. Within our grasp. It really is within our grasp. So thank you. Thank you all for joining me. I, I, it's such a pleasure to connect. And thank you, Mitch, for, for hosting me on, on the, the Edge Interactive tonight. It, it's really a great platform. And this has been a great conversation with Marsha and UC and, and Paul. So thank you all. Okay. Well, and, and thank you. Thank you to our, our live watchers. And thank you all to those of you who are watching this on the archives and hope to see you at FETC. Have a very happy holiday. This is Mitch Weisberg signing off for EdChat Interactive and see you soon. Good night.